Welcome back to Module 7, where we are now talking about Chapter 8, Earth as an Example Planet. In this particular video, we're going to start out with a couple of things that we don't really need to get into a lot of detail about and probably should have been covered in your high school um, earth science kind of class. But because we all have different backgrounds and different memories of those earlier classes, I want to make sure that we're on the same page, that we have the same starting point before we build on that. So the interior of the earth is something that is probably one of those topics that might be in the back of your mind, but I just want to make sure to cover it really briefly right now. We exist on the Earth's crust. It is a very thin outer layer of rocky material that sits on top of the mantle and is connected to the mantle. The mantle is the region of the Earth's interior that is also made of the same kind of rocky material but it is at much higher pressure and temperature, and so rather than fully solid the way that we might think of rock, it is able to flow, um, kind of like molasses or, or different um, similar, not quite watery substances. So it's kind of called a plastic uh, in a sense, but it's at these really high pressures that it is able to flow, even though it really is a solid Kind of hard to think about, but we'll, we'll move on from there. The core of the Earth is broken into two pieces. The inner core is the part that is fully solid, mostly iron, some nickel, and the outer core is liquid metal. It is material that is denser than the mantle, so it was able to kind of fall in towards the center as the Earth formed. And that outer core is moving. It is moving kind of around and is a big factor in the way that our magnetic field behaves. Earth's magnetic field is something that we briefly talked about when we talked about the sun and space weather. We talked about the ways in which the sun's activity can affect the Earth, aurora, things like that, and how the Earth has this protective magnetic field that helps um, prevent some of the worst events. Now, just to get a sense of scale, not because we're trying to memorize any of this, Earth's magnetic field extends about five Earth's worth of distance in front of it. When we say in front, we mean towards the sun direction. And the magnetic field can trail out as far as the orbit of the moon in the away from the sun direction. That's about 30 Earth's away. And so the moon can go through Earth's magnetic field. As a reminder to us from some of the stuff that we talked about in chapter 15, this magnetic field is not like a fancy sci-fi force field. It won't protect us from rocks, but what it can do is protect us from the charged particles that come from the sun in what's called the solar wind that we had already talked about briefly in chapter 15 and are thinking about again now. Getting back to the fact that we exist on the surface of the earth, on what's called the crust, the crust itself is broken up into large pieces that are physically moving around on the surface of the globe. This map shows the approximate current known structure of the plates and ways in which they're moving. And I want to point out a couple of things. First of all, in the middle of the Atlantic, plates are moving away from one another. What that means is they are creating a gap where plates moving away creates this gap and new material from the mantle is able to kind of well up and create new material that becomes um, part of that crustal plate. That is called a rift zone. So we have these rift zones that typically happen in the oceans. So uh, we have here as well um, on the Pacific plate here where they are coming apart from one another and creating new crust. There are also places where the um, crust is moving towards each other. So let's think about here, for example, along the South American coast on the Chile side. There is a crustal plate that is mostly ocean and a crustal plate that is mostly continent. The ocean plate is thinner and um, denser. And so when they come together, 
the oceanic plate actually slides underneath the continental plate. This is called a subduction zone. And it is a way for us to basically get rid of that older oceanic plate material because once it goes underneath, it warms up, heats up, um, higher pressure, it becomes part of the mantle, and we basically throw out the old crust. So there's this recycling idea of rock that is a really important part of how Earth is different than all of the other planets um, in our own solar system. Now, these two um, examples, on the top we have the rift zone I mentioned before, on the bottom we have the subduction zone. We don't have to memorize those terms. We aren't in a geology class and we aren't in a solar system specific class. So this is a smaller topic in the grand scheme of our semester, but I do want us to be aware that it is something that makes Earth unique within our solar system. We are the only planet that has this ongoing recycling of its crust. It is a way for the craters that we used to have to basically be erased um, from the oceanic plates. And for the continental plates, erosion processes um, can also help to erase that, as well as new rock that is creative, created by volcanic eruptions and other things like that. So plate tectonics is a way for us to have this refreshing of our um, crust on Earth. Okay, so a pause and think question for us. The change in position of the continents that we see on our globe over time is primarily caused by which of these listed things? All right. So sometimes people read a little bit too quickly and they see in question one the continental plate statement but they aren't floating on the ocean. So the plates themselves are attached to and being moved by the mantle. And so option two here, the mantle material is circulating inside the earth. That circulation, it may be worth writing down, that circulation is convection. The same convection that we talked about for the sun's outer layers beneath the photosphere. If we remember back in chapter 15, the sun, um, chapter 15 and 16, the sun has a radiative zone and then a convection zone. Hot stuff moves up, cold stuff moves down. Same thing with the Earth's mantle. It's the same overall physics process that's going on. Hotter material from deeper in the Earth is brought up near the crustal surface and then the colder material falls back down again. And that's why the mantle is moving around the way that it is. Okay, so we mentioned that the Earth is able to erase a lot of its impact crater history, and I want to make sure that we fully understand what we are seeing when we see a crater. So impact craters form when a large object hits a solid surface. So when we first have that impact happen, the huge amount of energy that came from a mass moving very fast all of that energy is basically deposited into the surface. It heats everything up, it vaporizes a lot of stuff, and throws a huge amount of material up into the air. That material settles down, some of it falls right back down where it came from, and some of it is um, ejected further out. So by the time we end up with a visible crater in step D here, we aren't actually seeing the full amount that was um, basically scooped out by that impact, but what we are seeing is how the ejecta fell back down again and created a um, raised ridge around the impact site. If you have the time and resources available, you can do something like this at home. If you've got like flour that you put into a um, like loaf pan, and a very small layer of um, cocoa powder on top of that. If you throw a marble or a rock into it, you'll be able to see the flower create this ejecta pattern as it was scooped up um, from the lower levels and then deposited back on top. So kind of a fun experience uh, if you have the time and the resources for it. Okay, so we see a whole bunch of craters 
on objects in our solar system. Mercury is completely covered with them, the moon is completely covered with them, and a lot of the outer um, solar system um, moons, satellites uh, around the giant planets also have lots of craters. The structure that we see, especially in the largest craters, the structure that we see here in the middle, if we see that um, briefly, there's this raised central region that can happen when a crater is so large that it actually liquefies the rock. It heats up the rock enough that it kind of splashes up and then solidifies um, that same way. And then there's a uh, the ring around it. Again, one of the big ways that we can tell that there's a crater here is by looking at the shadows, um, which is something Galileo had done back in chapter two when we covered him. Um, but on Earth, we were not spared from impacts. We've just lost the record of most of them. Plate tectonics and the processes of erosion have erased most of the impacts that covered the Earth, the impacts that happened early in the solar system's history. And in fact, some of the structures that we still have today are from impacts that aren't that old in time. You can check out section 8.5 in the textbook to see some of these pictures of impacts. And um, on the right here is the Tunguska explosion, which um, if you're interested, I, I urge you to look up some more information about it. it this um, image of trees is from something that didn't even fully impact the ground. It exploded in the air above an uninhabited region of Siberia and the trees were flattened in all directions as the shock wave basically from that explosion hit them. And then the impact that led to the extinction of the dinosaurs uh, is one that is also very hard for us to be able to see the full um, outline of, but geologists have worked with astronomers to figure out just how big that impactor would have been and how much material it would have thrown up into our atmosphere. Um, and one thing to be really kind of cognizant of is that the impact happened in one small region of our globe. This was not a all of a sudden kill all the dinosaurs because they got hit by this thing. The big problem that happened from this impact is that all of the material that got sent up into the atmosphere basically blanketed the atmosphere as it slowly settled back out and we didn't get as much sunlight, um, the earth didn't get as much sunlight being able to get to the surface as it normally does. And so plants died out and the part of the food chain, the, the dinosaurs that ate mostly plants, they started to die out because they didn't get enough to eat. And the carnivores, the dinosaurs that mostly ate this these herbivores, they started to die out too. And that's really where the mass extinction event came from. It was not instantaneous. It was because of all that ejected material in the impact. And then a much younger crater, one that is possible to visit um, if you're ever in the Southwest United States, is Meteor Crater. It's also known as Behringer Crater. And it's about um, a little less than a mile across, 1.2 kilometers across. And it was formed about 50,000 years ago. That number, our brains tell us, is really big, but I need us to remember the Earth is four and a half billion years old. This is a very young crater in the grand scheme of things. And this almost mile-wide crater came from an object, a meteorite, that was probably about 50 meters in diameter, so not a full football field of distance, and it carved out this huge mile-wide crater. It's one of, actually, the single largest intact impact craters in our whole solar system because there's nothing else around it. There's no other craters that are all lying on top of each other the way that we see with Mercury and um, Mars and, and the moon. Instead, it's in the high, dry desert of Arizona, and so there's not a lot of erosion happening to it either. So if you ever get the chance, um, I highly recommend checking it out. This brings us to the end of this particular video where if we look back, um, this video was mostly to make sure we understand the different layers of the Earth, how the crust 
is able to recycle itself to erase this knowledge that we have of impact greater craters, except for the very youngest. In the next video, we'll be talking about Earth's atmosphere uh, and how it is so essential to life here on Earth so that we can use that understanding as we get into chapter 30, life elsewhere in the universe. So I will see you in that next video.